Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. Epilepsy is a neurologic disorder that affects the central nervous system and causes seizures. It affects 3 million Americans and nearly 65 million people worldwide. Thankfully, treatment with medications and sometimes even surgery can control seizures for the majority of patients with epilepsy. We're discussing this now because November is National Epilepsy Awareness Month. So thanks for being with us and learning something with me today. Here to discuss this topic with us is Mayo Clinic neurologist, Dr. Joseph Servin. Thanks for being here today, sir. Oh, it's a pleasure to be joining you all as well. Would you talk a little bit about what causes epilepsy and who is at risk for it? The truth is uh, epilepsy can impact anyone at any age group. So theoretically, everyone is kind of at risk, but there are clear causes and the causes vary by age. Typically, if you're very young, we would worry most about infections or some type of genetic process. As you get into adulthood, we start looking for things such as traumatic brain injury or brain tumors. As someone gets older, we start thinking about stroke, dementia, and other like blood hemorrhages and things of that sort. One in 26 individuals will develop epilepsy over the course of their lifetime. So that tells you it can affect almost anyone and the cause they vary so much, again, depending on how old you are. So it's kind of a universal condition, but I don't think it's appreciated as such. How do you diagnose epilepsy? Your diagnosis of epilepsy still is based on the history and description of having discrete seizures. That is, having events that are seizures. The thing about seizures, though, they can present in so many ways. Most people, when I use that word, they think of a big convulsion falling down, very dramatic, you can't miss it. But there are a lot of other possibilities, such as uh, people who may stare or may not respond, or they may have a, a certain repetitive tremor. And so listen to that story, that clinical history is huge. There are additional studies that we do in addition to the history and examination. Uh, an EEG, that's a study where you put brain leads on the scalp of the head, it's painless, uh, can give us some supporting evidence. An MRI of the brain can also help to show some of those causes I mentioned earlier to see if that may be responsible. So it's really putting it all together is how you arrive at that diagnosis. Just to, to clarify for me, is it appropriate to interchange epilepsy and seizure disorder? Epilepsy is often considered a pejorative term uh, by so many people because it, it seems to convey a certain uh, sense of negativity or stigma. The truth is uh, epilepsy and seizure disorder are technically the same thing. Epilepsy is a condition of unprovoked seizures occurring repetitively. Seizure disorder is basically saying I have more than one seizure. So you're really saying the same thing. It just, for some reason, people seem to give a friendlier pass to seizure disorder than the word epilepsy, even though it's the same exact concept. What causes an epileptic seizure to begin? Yeah, so at the end, a seizure is an abnormal electrical communication, uh, almost like a power surge, if you will, that occurs in the cortical neurons. Those are the cells of the brain. And again, the causes vary uh, by, just like the word epilepsy, by age and possibilities. But in oftentimes, uh, it can be something as common as prescription medication. Uh, it can be uh, some injury, a head injury, that there's blood or a big shock to the system. It could be the tumor, it could be the stroke, a lot of different possibilities. But either, whatever the cause is, that imbalance is what leads to that sudden surge of electricity that shouldn't be there. How do you identify a seizure in someone having one? Do they all look the same? And how long would you expect them to last? Yeah, the typical duration of a seizure is roughly about a minute, but the recovery from the seizure can be several minutes. 
Uh, and so oftentimes it's hard to distinguish the seizure itself from the recovery period. Uh, the seizures can vary uh, depending on what part of the brain has that electrical surge. The most common part of the brain is the temporal lobe. So people may report a funny stomach upset or a rising sensation in their stomach. Uh, and then they basically can have an inability to speak. Uh, they will have kind of repetitive movements of some sort. And then what's very difficult for us in medicine to figure out, they don't have recollection they even had the event. So that can be very hard to kind of get that history once it's occurred. So you have to talk to a lot of witnesses. Now, if it's in the, let's say it's in the occipital lobe of the brain that controls vision, it may be very quiet or in a very different looking seizure because the person may perceive visual changes or something along those lines. Again, all of this can rapidly spread and then the person falls and has a big event. And those are very apparent and those are called generalized tonic onic seizures. Um, people can present with some of those, all of those, none of those, because there's uh, a lot of different seizure types that do occur and that we can classify. Uh, and it just depends on where it is in the brain, to be honest with you. Dr. Servan, I grew up in the 80s, and I remember many school dances with strobe lights going around, the kids all saying, oh my goodness, that light's going to give me a seizure. Can computer lights, uh, computer screens, or other lights cause someone to have a seizure? Yeah, there are certain genetic versions of epilepsy and or seizure disorder that are actually very sensitive to the frequency at which a light is flashed. The lower the flash rate or the closer it approximates the normal frequencies that occur in the brain. And if you have a genetic predisposition, it can actually lead to a seizure. And in fact, a couple of movies, uh, which uh, surprised me recently, they actually put warning signals uh, to that effect uh, just to be safe. But yeah, for a certain group of individuals, you can precipitate a seizure in that way. Can stress um, affect someone with epilepsy or cause seizures? Stress is one of those conditions I kind of like into uh, weather reports. And, and so when you get a weather report, they always say there's a thunderstorm watch or a thunderstorm warning, tornado watch, tornado warning. What they're trying to say is that the ingredients are ripe for a tornado to occur or, tor or thunderstorm to occur in that watch, but a warning means they actually see it. Very similarly, stress is one of those ingredients that makes it more likely to occur but it doesn't mean it's going to occur. So it's just one of those conditions that, yeah, we hear a lot of people who have seizures report that stress was occurring at the time they had it. And yeah, that may have been the ingredient, but it's not the actual cause. It was maybe the match or the extra thing that pushed you over that led to the actual cause to lead to the seizure. How do you treat epilepsy? Well, here's the good news. There's a lot of treatments. Uh, there's uh, almost, uh, the, the short answer is there's medications. If medications don't work, there's surgery, there's even diet, there are devices. Uh, ultimately, the first stop, uh, if someone has more than one seizure and there's a reason to put them on medication, is to start a medication. There's roughly 30 different medications that are available in the U.S. market for seizures, and they vary depending on cause, the seizure type, uh, the age, the side effect. And so really, it's picking one of those medications. If more than two meds have been tried and they have not stopped seizures, then we start thinking about epilepsy surgery. And there are a, a lot of different variations on surgery that can be done, assuming it's safe and we can find a discrete single location from where the seizures are arising from in order for us to be able to do that. If surgery isn't possible, then we start looking at devices. Devices help to serve almost like a pacemaker for the brain. There are about four different types that can be utilized and are all available within the Mayo system. And then the other item is that there is a diet, believe it or not, uh, the ketogenic diet, modified Atkins diet, actually invented at Mayo Clinic, I might add, in the uh, late 1920s. 
uh, is one of the acceptable management strategies uh, for certain types of epilepsy. So uh, the point is lots and lots of possibilities that may work. I also remember hearing that people with um, epilepsy or seizure disorder are not allowed to drive. Is yeah. that true? Can patients drive? Can they exercise? Can they play sports? The, uh, I'll start with the driving. So uh, that one is specifically called out on almost every state law uh, that if someone's had a seizure where they lost consciousness uh, and they make a big point of that, uh, then you are not able to drive. Now, the duration that you're not able to drive varies from state to state, believe it or not. Uh, from three months uh, in Arizona, six months in Minnesota, and in Florida. Uh, and it can go up to a year for certain other states. So at the end, they all insist that you become seizure-free for that amount of time before you're allowed to drive. But if you are well-managed, yeah, you can drive. Exercise, exercise is never the wrong answer. You can always find something that's safe to do. Uh, run, walk, whatever, you go outside. So that is something that absolutely is available uh, for anyone. Play sports, absolutely, maybe it's not the right thing if uh, you're gonna play boxing or uh, maybe you have to be a little bit more careful if you're gonna do scuba diving where there's a little element of additional risk should a seizure occur. But for a vast majority of other sports and activities, oh, absolutely. There's no reason this should stop anyone from doing what they want to do. Dr. Servan, you mentioned earlier that there are some predisposing conditions that can cause someone to develop epilepsy over, the life, over their lifetime. Is there a way to prevent epilepsy if someone should have one of those disorders that might lend itself to that problem? Yeah, I, I wish I could uh, simply say that there is an easy uh, preventative. Uh, uh, the answer is not really. It's, it's really preventing whatever those causes are. So for, uh, let me kind of uh, take it for an older adult. If we know that uh, stroke is a cause, uh, and actually the most, one of the more common causes of seizures in the older adult, preventing strokes then becomes a way that you actually prevent epilepsy in people. Same is true for other potential causes for which you can make uh, very conscious decisions to avoid having a problem with later in life. Once you have uh, epilepsy specific preventative measures, not too much that we know of, but the hope is that as we try to understand epilepsy and how it develops in people, we may have an ability to do something such as that in the not too distant future, I guess is the best way to put it. Is there a cure for epilepsy for any patients? Yeah, there are actually. Uh, epilepsy surgery in the right patient, that is, that we know where it's coming from and it's safe to resect, can actually result in a definitive cure. Uh, up to 70 to 80% of individuals who are identified as good surgical candidates that actually go through it can lead to complete seizure freedom, a seizure cure. Uh, and that is huge news uh, for those individuals. What's sad about it is that often it's underutilized. Uh, surgery is a scary proposition for a lot of people, but there's so many new techniques. It's become so much safer uh, to do them. And you don't even have to stay in the hospital that long anymore. Uh, roughly two days is the average admission length. Uh, for individuals who undergo such a procedure. So yeah, cures do exist for the right people. Everything is COVID-19 now, so I would be remiss if I did not ask you, does having epilepsy predispose someone to greater risk from COVID-19? No, actually uh, having epilepsy does not put you at a greater risk uh, for developing COVID-19. The therapies are not necessarily ones that are going to uh, kind of quiet down your immune system or have anything along those lines. Now, to play it on the other side, COVID-19, because it's an infection, can very much worsen seizures and epilepsy in people who have it. But that's true for any infection, uh, whether it's uh, influenza, the flu, uh, pneumonia, a urinary tract infection, uh, any infection actually increases the risk of worsening seizures and 
COVID-19 is definitely in that camp. What is the latest research um, that's going on surrounding epilepsy? Yeah, the latest research uh, is kind of falls in a couple of different camps. Uh, one is that there are uh, novel tools that everyone is trying to figure out on how to predict when a seizure is going to occur. Uh, that would be huge because one of the things that people complain about the most is that there's no prediction as to when the next seizure is going to occur. And if they knew when a seizure is going to occur, they would be able to do something. So predicting seizures is one of those areas of research that is very exciting. The other one is a very different approach to the treatment of seizures. And that is that we are now uncovering uh, that there are a lot of immunological conditions where seizures can occur, where there's a funny antibody circulating in your body that's causing hairy carry that's leading to seizures. Now, what's important about that is that the treatment for something in that manner is going to be very different from anti-seizure drugs, but it's gonna be all about uh, calming the immune system down and uh, trying to reduce inflammation. So those are two very different areas that are very exciting uh, and, and something to be honest with you that I've watched happen just even over the course of my career that no one even considered once upon a time. It's amazing. One of my favorite things about this job is learning about research that I would not have otherwise known was going on until I might read about it later. It's exactly, it's, it's funny living all of this, uh, watching history unfold, if you will. Dr. Servin, tell us why epilepsy Awareness Month is important? You know, one of the reasons that Epilepsy Awareness Month is, is huge is, is that a lot of people are very stigmatized by the condition. They do not want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about it for a couple of reasons. One of them I mentioned earlier is because they don't want to lose their ability to drive. Uh, they are afraid that they're going to lose their job uh, if their employer finds out because there's a lot of miseducation. So Epilepsy Awareness Month, just by definition, helps people put a spotlight on an area that we actually should be talking more about. It's a super common condition. And as you just heard a little moment ago, there's a lot of things we can do for it. And the worst thing is just to sit there languishing at home because you're afraid of an employer not being able to drive or something in that manner, uh, and just all afraid of all the consequences when the truth is there's a lot of hope and a lot of things that we can do. And something like Epilepsy Awareness Month helps to shine that light so that people talk about it and it's not made such a huge deal. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic neurologist, Dr. Joseph Servin, for being here today, telling us about advances in epilepsy research and treatments, and for talking with us about Epilepsy Awareness Month. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu. Thanks for listening and be well.